Oh, hi everyone. Welcome to this Neuromat event. I'm, I have the pleasure to welcome you. And I'm just going to give you some piece of information. The first one is that this whole event is on live streaming. If you'd like to tell people about it, or if any, any time you'd like to check how this event, event went, you just go to Neuromat's webpage, which is here, neuromat.numec.prp.usp.br, and you'll find, now it's already the second post on our website, Neuromat host its first Young Researchers Workshop, and you have a link to the USP IPTV streaming. You just click on this uh, link here. I would like to thank the people who are on this dark room here making this streaming available for you all. And I also like to remember everyone that tomorrow night there is a dinner at the Hotel Solarium where many of you are staying. If you'd like to, if you are planning to attend, you need to uh, confirm your presence with Lourdes Neto, who is here at the back. She has a map for people who are not staying in the hotel. And with no further ado, I'm going to introduce Antonio Gauss, who is the... Oh, you don't need to pay. <laughs> but there is no free food. So, <laughs> so you're paying, you just don't know how. <laughs> so I'm going to... Welcome, Antonio Galvez, who is going to uh, give the, the introduction of this event. So please, Professor, thank you so much for coming. Okay, a few words. The idea of the meeting was uh, given by Hawk and Claudia a few months ago. It was a great idea. That's the second meeting organized. The first one was, was with all the old people speaking. Now, it was natural to think uh, about um, on a meeting for younger researchers to meet each other and discuss. So thank you very much, Hawk and Claudia, for having the idea. By the way, Hawk, a uh, distinguished member of the Neuromat team, is uh, now our director of scientific diffusion. Uh, so you, he is responsible for, with Juan, uh, for many of the things you see, like the web page and so on. Okay, so it's a pleasure to, ho to, to, to host all of you here. And our first speaker, I guess, is Andresa. I chose the first session, yeah, and then, and then, session. and then, okay. and then, okay. 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 That's the idea. Okay. So, good morning. No. Uh, my name is Andresa, and I... I'm doing my PhD in statistics, and today I will talk about this, this work that I did in my master thesis, and it's a joint work with Claudia Vargas, Daniel Farma, and my advisor, Florencia Leonardo. So, I don't have the pointer, it's okay. So, uh, the main goals of this work is the construction of a hypothesis test for samples of graph and its application to analyze uh, graphs built from EEG data. So here, let's start with a simple definition of graph. So a simple graph is a pair V and E, where V is a finite set of vertices, and we represent these vertices by these little circles in blue in this picture. and E is a set of edges that we represent them by this red line that connect a uh, par pair of vertices. So uh, the graph can be represented by its adjacent matrix. 
where if we take uh, two pairs of graphs, for example, i and j, uh, g, i and j, <laughs> I don't know it's the best way to show, but g, i and j is equal to 1 if there is an edge between i and j. Okay, so uh, the adjacent matrix is a matrix is a matrix composed by zeros and ones. So in the hypothesis test, uh, we have uh, two sample of graphs that we uh, I represent by this bold G. So the bold G is always a sample of graphs. Uh, so we have two samples of graphs, G and G prime, and we want to test if these samples were originated from the same probability distribution. So in the new hypothesis, that is this H, it is, um, we have that pi is equal to pi prime, where pi is the distribution who, uh, which originated the sample G, and pi prime is the distribution which originated G prime, okay, is the notation that I will use in this presentation. So here I define uh, the test statistic. So we need a statistic to do uh, to do your test. So t is equal to the maximum of this absolute value, and this maximum over all graphs with set of vertices v. So this d bar is is um, is the average is the average uh, distance between the one graph G to the sample of graphs this board G, and the distance that we use is this capital D that is some kind of comparison with the matrix uh, edges adjacent matrix of the graphs. Okay, so it's this bo um, capital D. So uh, we define the critical region of the test. Uh, the region, crit the critical region of the test is the values of this statistic T that is greater than a quantile of the distribution of T under the new hypothesis. The new hypothesis that P is equal to the pri P prime, pi prime. So in, in some cases, the set of all, vert, of all graphs can be extremely large, large. For example, if we take 20 verts of the graph. So in this case, if you has, we saw the, 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 the statistic T depends on the total of the graphs with set of vertices V. So it's really difficult to compute the T. So how can I compute T in this case that the set of verts can be large? So we we proved that uh, the st we can compute the statistic T by the sum over all pair of vertices where this G bar is the average number of connections between the edges i and g in the sample. Okay, so we will um, compare these this mean numbers of connections between the samples g and g prime. So we saw that the critical region depends on the distribution of t under the new hypothesis. So what's the distribution of t? So in your last result, we proved that if we increase the sample size, or, uh, I mean, n, when we n and m goes to infinite, uh, the, statistic the statistic of the test is the sum over all pair of vertices of the absolute value from normal, normal distributions. And it's important to remark that these normal uh, random variables uh, can be not independent. So here we have this uh, sigma is the covariance matrix of these normal random variables. Okay. So uh, it's uh, the theoretical part of the this work, and here I will show you uh, some one simulation result. So first, uh, let me. 
So uh, remember, uh, let's remember that the power of the test, power of hypothesis test is the probability. It's not good. You can see? You can see? Yeah, yeah but I'm not sure. Yes. So uh, let's remember that the power of function of the test is the probability of reject the new hypothesis. So reject, oh God, reject, reject the new hypo hypothesis when we know, we knew that the alternative hypothesis is true. So when we knew that H, R, I think that I use A, H, A, It's true. So we know that the distributions of G and G prime is different, and we want to reject H0, the new hypothesis. So we we will compare we compare the power function of your test with the power function of simultaneous test. And what is a simultaneous test? Is simultaneous test is a another form to compare. Ver, uh, samples of graphs because here we have a graph and uh, in the simultaneous test I will test uh, first the connections between these ads and the connections between these and these and these and this so uh, if we have uh, in this case 10 vertices I need to do 4 to 5 tests so it's not a good way to test graphs. You know, we need to do uh, four to five tests. And in your case, we just need to, to perform only one test. So uh, here we use uh, the erdos Henny model. So let's remember what's the uh, erdos Henny model in the erdos Henny, erdos Henny model. We have that uh, the probability of has of there is an edge between this pair of vertices is p for all pair of all edges of this graph is always p and an edge e is independent of has a, an edge in another pair of vertices so we we will use this this model and we we use it a modify erdos Henny model that is we we will choose a percent a percentual of a percentual number of ads, for example, these ones. And here we use, we will change the, this probability by here I will use always 0 0.5. And here I will, I will change the probability by p, p, p. Okay, we just modify the erdos Henny test to the, the simulations. It's clear here. It's, it's difficult to explain this. Uh, so here is the the power function that we 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 ha we had. So I will give some you know, some seconds to take a look in this picture. So here in the in this solid line, we have the power of your test, and in this dashed line is the power of using the simultaneous test. So remember that the power of the test is reject when we knew that H A is true. So we, in the best way, we 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 always want to to reject. So this probability we want to approach to one okay so if you take a look in this picture we, we the first thing that we we can see is that your test the power of your test is always greater than the the power using buffer honey tests simultaneous tests and 
uh, when we remember that I use here 0 0.5 and when the difference between P and 0 0.5 grows, your, your power function appro approaches to the number one. So that's perfect, that's what we want. Okay. This is just one of the simulations. Uh, we did simulations for, this is, is the, how can I say this, easy, it's not easy, but it's the, I don't know, the trivial case because all these, uh, all these variables here are independent. And we did this for, we did this, this simulation. Um, we have we have simulation results for the case that they these variables are not e, uh, independent. So, for example, using 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 exponential random graphs. So now let's move on to the application of your test. So we want to compare graphs uh, built from EEG data collected during the observation of videos depicting uh, a human locomotion. So here is the stimulus that about eight people watched uh, uh, 25 times. And this stimulus is composed by 10 marks that represent marks in the human body, for example, uh, shoulders, head, head uh, hands. And this stimulus is composed by two phases, the visual phase where the visible phase when we represent a uh, a walker's uh, movement and the occlusion phase where where these uh, these marks disappear behind a black wall and in the second stimulus we scramble these marks destroying uh, the perspective of a walker's movement okay. and here we divided the time in four windows to the visible phase in the four windows the first four windows for the occlusion phase here is a diagram where uh, I show how to build graph using EEG data, just a, a kind of scheme, uh, a diagram. So, in the first, so the first thing that I did is divide the visible phase in four windows, the occlusion phase in four windows. Take the EEG signal, choose uh, an interaction criterion, interaction criterion to obtain a correlation matrix and use a <laughs> choose another another on network criterion to build a graph. And today I won't be I won't focus in these criterions, just move on to the graphs that we built. So here's the number of graphs that we built using this this interaction criterion and network criterion. Here's the P values that we obtain performance uh, tested visible phase with occlusion phase. So we we will we test the first window to the visible phase with the first window of occlusion phase. The second with the second, third with the third. In. So uh, the graphs from the visible phase with the occlusion phase. Ah, is that the, always the new hypothesis or test is, this, is that the graphs has the same distribution. The graphs have the same distribution. Yeah, thank you, Antonio. And uh, here we, we can see that the, the p-values obtained in the first window is, is significant, is smaller than the others. And it happens uh, because in the first... Uh, in the first window of the visible phase, there is an event-related potation uh, related with the, uh, how can I say, with the, uh, with the appearance, thanks for with the appearance of a visible stimulus on the screen. In the visible phase, in the visible uh, phase, we have this stimulus. In the occlusion phase, is a percent of this stimulus. So here we show that. Uh, that your test is able to detect this difference, that is good because we construct a test and, te and test these graphs building for EEG and he, 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 he found this difference, so it's good for us. And it's it what I want to show you today. So 
here if is your your paper is able on archive if you want to take a look in your results and your simulation results or in your results from the results from the e e g it's it thank you <laughs> Time for a few questions. So, if you didn't understand something, please ask. Please. So, you show that uh, you found difference in the first part of the experiment. I'm curious about your results for the remaining parts of the graph. Um, did you test for? I saw that in your table. You didn't comment on that, but you. Apparently, you didn't find any difference on the remaining parts after the first phase. Can you go back to the table, please? Yes. Um, so the p-values in the last one, v4 v versus o4, uh, what, what is that again? The, the fourth window of the Another one, maybe. Sorry. Does it, I'm sorry. So uh, v4 is the fourth window of the visible phase, and o4 is the fourth window of the occlusion phase. Is there any uh, biological explanation why you found difference on that specific? Uh, on the last? Yes. Yes. Um, First, uh, it's not so significant difference that we found. So the p-value is 0 0.0.2 0 .0 in com compared with the others in the first window. And actually, I don't have an idea why. <laughs> it's difficult to explain. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, the difference is there. So now we have to find a biological explanation, right? Uh, I could think of a second difference, a, a later difference. I mean, each window here has 333 yes, yes. milliseconds, so it's a, a late response. Um, it could be related to later processes of, uh, of uh, identification of the biological movement, but I think, well, we, it's not clear for us that the first one is very neat, and it's obvious because of the presence of the event-related. So, Antonio, wants to say No, no, I, I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, okay, I think that's... So, if thank you. you. questions, uh, uh, enjoy the coffee to discuss. Let me tell you something. Uh, so, I, I think it was a very nice talk, uh, Andresa, thank you very much. But in general, I would strongly advise everybody to start with the neurobiological motivation. Because this would make the life much simpler for everybody. And I know it's much simpler for mathematicians like me to start from my comfort zone and speak about mathematics. So I scare you and then I can do anything. And many very famous neuroscientists in the world do this in a very successful way. And if you want me to give you the names I give you after, very successful, but it's not a good way. I think it's better to make everybody comfortable about the problem. So I strongly advise all of you, of course, not now, to start with a neurobiological problem and to try to put it in the perspective of our project. Our project is not putting together mathematicians, neurobiologists. No, our problem or our project aims to put in the same questions the both communities. But it was very nice talk. So the next speaker is... Next speaker. If anyone wants to use the pointer... Tem, aí é 
é só, se quiser usar o pointer é só tirar e pôr. É. Eu gosto do amarelo. Deixa eu. So I ask everyone to put the huh? presentation uh, there uh, during oh. lunch time or talk time. Okay. If anyone want, who is going to use the laptop wants to use this, just let me know and then I'll lend it to you. Hello, good morning. My name is Bia Ramalho. I come from the Laboratório de Neurobiologia 2 at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And I'm, my supervisors are Claudia Vargas, Professor Claudia Vargas and Fatima Mertal. And today I will, I will talk about some data of my master thesis in, uh, that is entitled Investigation of the threshold and referred sensation in brachial plexus injuries. Uh, the brachial plexus, é o ponto seria legal. The brachial plexus is a group of nerves that extend from the spinal cord to supply the upper limb with autonomic motor and sensor innervation. They are like cables that conduct inf information of the cortex to the muscle, the motor cortex to the muscle to realize movements and they conduct information of, for example, of the skin to the cortex to we feel the sensations. The, the, uh, the brachial plexus divide uh, mainly in roots, trunks, cords and branches that will generate the nerves, the, ah, I will talk with you. the muscle cutaneous, like the muscle cutaneous and the axillary nerves. And uh, it's formed, it is formed by uh, the cervical root C5 to C8 and the thoracic root T1. The C5 and C5 and C6 uh, root will form the superior trunk. The C7 will form the middle trunk, and the C8 and T1 will form the inferior trunk. Uh, injuries can affect one trunk, two trunks, or all of the trunks. And when it happens, uh, it can lead to a moral or sensory alteration. When the cable, this cable, these cables are damaged or broken, uh, we found in the patient uh, some kind of moral and sensory alterations, deficits. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, surgeries to reconstruct the brachial plexus after the injury, uh, like neurolysis, sutures, graft, stabilizations, and nerve transfers. And I will give you an example of one a surgery that is the intercostal nerve to muscle cutaneous nerve, nerve, nerve transfer. And in this uh, surgery, branches of the inter intercostal nerve, that it's a nerve that nerve the rib cage, are uh, transferred to the muscle cutaneous nerve, that is a nerve that innervates the biceps and this region of the arm to uh, return the function of this muscle and the sensory innervation of this region. Uh, this kind of surgery is, is made, I guess, in patients that have a complete lesion of the brachial plexus and all the trunks are uh, completely lesioned, then they have to use a, a nerve or out of the brachial plexus, like this nerve of the rib cage. Uh, we st uh, our sample was of 
fifth uh, patient, but just nine fulfilled the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, the median age was 32 years old. Uh, we had eight male and just one female. And they had different types of injuries affecting only one trunk or all of the trunks with different degrees of severity, uh, like, for example, avulsions and neuropraxis. Avulsion is the, the, the most severe type of lesion of these nerves, and the neuropraxis is the less severe. Neuropraxis is the stretching of the nerve. No, I'm passing. And... Uh, they were submitted to different uh, surgical repairs, uh, one or more, and just one patient uh, had not undergone the surgery. And the median time between the injury and the surgery was six months. Uh, firstly, we selected six points to uh, evaluate, assess the touch threshold sensitivity touch threshold of these patients. We select points that we call points of exclusive renovation that were re represent the autonomous zones and the matomous. The autonomous zones are the zones of the skin that we can stimulate uh, just one uh, nerve. And the matomous are the zones of the skin that are innervated by one cervical, one one root, one cervical root, like C4, C5. And then you give the example. Uh, this was the, the, were the points that we selected. And the blue one is the axillary nerve point that is within the C5 uh, dermatum. And another example is the muscle cutaneous and the median nerve, the, the red and green points, that are within the C6 dermatum and the others. Uh, to assess this th the touch threshold of these patients, we used a set of, uh, a set of 20 uh, Sims Weinstein filaments that are uh, filaments uh, made of ni nylon string filaments. And they are cali calibrated uh, to the force necessary to be bent onto the skin, like in this, like in this, in this image. So the the first one is the thinnest one and is called 1.65, and we need 0 0.008 gram of force to bend them onto the skin. And the thickest one is the 6.65, and it's a 300 gram force to be bent. And to facilitate, we number the, the, the filaments the, from 20 to the one, being 20 the thinnest and one the thickest one. And so to assess, we... we we were applying in each one of that points that we selected the th thinnest filament to the thickest filament, uh, one by one. And we applied uh, uh, five times each one, and the subject had to, to, to report that they feel uh, at least three or five stimuli. When they, they feel, feel felt three or five stimuli, uh, this is called the, the thickest the thickest filament that he could uh, feel. We call the uh, touch threshold of this point. And after this, we ask the I ah, know uh, if the sorry if the th 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 threshold is near the twenty filament, we said that he has a great sensitivity and. He, if it is uh, near the zero, he is lesser sens less sensitivity. And if the patient wasn't able to feel uh, even the thickest filament, that is the filament one, we said that the threshold was zero and the region is anesthesia. And then 
we uh, we ask, we asked what did they, did they feel, and they could say that they feel one or more of the sensations, and where they feel, and they need they should uh, point the regions that they feel the sensation, and could be more than one region. Uh, this is the image of our experimental setup. So the subject uh, should be seated comfortably and with a cur black curtain occluding the vision of the arm, like, like in this, and the arm should stay rested uh, comfortably in a pillow. Pill pill. First, uh, I will show you the results of the control group, the nine con controls. And uh, uh, this, this, these graphs uh, show use the median the, and the maximum and minimum threshold for each point. So in the x-axis we have the point, the regions, the axillary, musculocutaneous, etc. regions, and the y-axis, I guess that's this, is the number of the filament going to z from zero to twenty. So. To the right and left sides, the, the region that had the great sensibility was the axillary, muscle cutaneous, and black brachial plexus regions with the median threshold uh, with the thinnest filament. They was able to feel the thinnest filament. And the regions of the median radial and ulnar nerve, that are the nerves that innervated the hand, facing M. Dorsal, palm and dorsal, I don't know. We're well, between uh, 70 and 60, the threshold. And they are with the same profile. They, they are really parasit. Oi? Left and right. And the uninjured side, the healthy side of the patient, um, also show uh, the same profile of the right and left side of the control groups. But the injured side of the patient had a, a large variation uh, between the thresholds and with a, a axillary and muscle cutaneous nerve threshold really, really low. For example, the muscle cutaneous, the median uh, uh, and in general, uh, the Patients feel just the uh, most, the thickest filament, and this 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 w wide variety variation, <laughs> this wide variation is doing the do it do it the the different types of injuries because. The, the patients don't have the same injury, and the different types of surgery that they underwent, I guess. And because of this, we, we, we separate, separated the patients do uh, uh, do in categories, but in groups, in groups, by the diagnostic legion, this, this. So this first uh, graphic, I, I will show you with this. So the color bars are the patient, the different patient, and in this, this, this axis, we have the, the regions, and in this axis, we're, we have the number of the filaments. So, and the, these black bars are our control. Our control is the medium uh, from the right and left side of the controls and the uninjured side of the patient. So comparing the color bars with the black bars, we have that 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 graph represents the patient that have the most okay the most severe lesion and as we can see they the their threshold uh, are near zero or even zero for some 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 parts, some regions, and indeed we can see the graph of a patient with the less severe uh, lesion, with uh, alteration only in the axillary uh, region. 
And the other other type of sensation that we investigated was the referring sensation. That is the sensation felt in a place other than the place of the site of stimulation. Uh, and we assessed this type of sensation during the assessment of the touch threshold. So when we touch the, the region with the filaments and the patient related that he feel the sensation in a place different than the, that the place that we stimulated, we call this referred sensation. For example, if we stimulated the region of the median nerve, the patient related sensation in the other side of the hand or in the middle of the forearm. And this was the referred sensation that we uh, selected. And both uh, controls and patient uh, reported referent sensation, but the referent sensation was uh, most present in the injured side of the patient. Two patients that underwent that surgery that I explained before, the, of the intercostal tumor subcutaneous transfer, uh, reported that they feel uh, the referred sensation in the trunk after stimulation of the forearm, that is the region of the muscle cutaneous. And this type of sensation, when this type of sensation uh, uh, is well known, uh, it's described in the, the, at the literature, in, like in this figure, after the stimulation of this region, that is the muscle cutaneous region, the patient reported feeling the touch in the trunk. And to uh, uh, assess this type of sensation and evaluate the extent of innervation of this region, we made a, a grid with dots uh, around the, the region of the muscle cutaneous, and we stimulate like a key here, and we stimulate with the thickest filament, each dot, and the patient had to relate the sensation, if he, if he, he felt the sensation in the forearm or in the trunk. And I will show you just one example. Uh, we have two, but, but I will show you just one. That is the patient four. The, th this patient is a patient with a serious injury of all the trunks of the brachial plexus. And he undergone this, this type of surgery and another one that is the accessory to suprascapular nerve transfer. The time between injury and surgery was three months. And the time between surgery and that this exam was 22 months. And the sensitivity that I, uh, I assess with the other test uh, revealed to me that the participant have the capacity to feel only the thickest filaments, the filament number one, in the axillary and radial nerve. And this re light, light, lighter region is the region of the innervation. This uh, red symbols indicates the region, the points that after I stimulated, he uh, relate the reports, the sensation in the trunk that is in this region, uh, in these regions. And this uh, area with black symbols are the areas of anesthesia. He, the patient was not uh, able to feel the, the touch of the filament. And the extent of uh, innervation, uh, taking the most proximal and most distal uh, points, uh, was uh, five centim centimeters. And for giving you an example, uh, after touching the three, this three point, uh, the patient related the sensation of sliding touch on this region. E. After touch this point, uh, he reported sensation of prick in this region. He after uh, touch the one and two points, uh, he related the sensation of formication in the scar uh, region. Cacaban. Just the. Acabou então que cacaban? Uh, and to finish, uh, uh, our, as our cortex, our sensory cortex now, for example, uh, is uh, somatotopically uh, 
divided in regions uh, that represent our body parts, like in that that in this figure where the trunk and lower limb are in the medial region and the uh, upper limb and face are represented laterally. And the uh, the muscle cutaneous information comes from the uh, arm to the cortex in a region lat later, in a lateral region. And the muscle cutaneous information comes from the trunk to a medial region. Because the trunk is represented the rib information is the rib cage information goes to a region more immediately. But after the the damage and the reconstruction, the transferred uh, branches of the intercostal now will grow by the the muscle cutaneous nerve and reinnervate this area. But the information of the the but but the but the path that this that this information of this region will follow will not achieve the forearm region. Now it is achieving the trunk region, and this uh, type of of and is in. This is why this kind of cessation happened with these patients after this this surgery and this this type of sensation can do do can least last can last f forever or or uh, and or sometimes they can uh, uh, disappear they can disappear and it, it is explained by the plasticity or uh, the growing of new connections uh, to the lateral region of the cortex sensory cortex or by the masking of horizontal connections between these regions in the sensory cortex thanks a lot <laughs> Very nice talk. We don't have time for discussion, but uh, in the last day, we have a long session of the remarks, so write your comments. So the third one is Bruno Mont. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Bruno. I'm a student for Antonio. Uh, this is a work in progress for my PhD uh, with the title Spike Softening for Interacting Neurons. Uh, I will introduce to define what is spike sorting. When uh, we do extracellular recordings, we can find uh, spikes for more than one neuron. So we want to know uh, to distinguish these spikes and say what neuron originate each one of them. Okay? This is what we call spike sorting. The most common way to do that is to look at the shape of the waveform uh, collect with the electrodes. And if for 50 years people were doing reasonable sorting using only this information. This is a picture on you have a electrode here. Uh, you can observe it, you have some neuron close to this electrode. You have some neurons far from them. Uh, the neurons they are close to him uh, the electrode will receive a um, large amplitude from them and a uh, small amplitude for the electrodes, uh, the, the neurons is for the electrode. And this is the signal we receive when we have an electrode. The most 
part of this signal is noise, you have some points you have this stuck in here. This point can be a spike or not, depends on the threshold. And in November last year, we received Christophe Pouzat, he is the most, one of the most specialists in the area. He presented a mini course of spike sorting during three days. You can find it uh, in our website, in Neuromat. Uh, we also uh, recorded an interview for him. Uh, he talked about the problem to use only the amplitude information to do sorting. I will present two minutes of this video. That's where an automatic algorithm, after not so rare, only. As a matter of fact, using amplitude information only, as we've been doing so far, won't work for some datasets. We illustrate the problem with a toy example of simulated data. We have here three neurons. The tiny neuron, drawn in red, generates events in the same region as the two other neurons. That means that if we use only amplitude information, for most of the spikes of the tiny neuron, we won't be able to tell from which neuron they originate. We need to use more information than just amplitude information. What property of the data have, have we been neglecting so far? The occurrence time of the spikes. We know that neurons generate spikes with a rather specific discharge statistics. And ideally, we would like to include this information or an estimation of this information in our sorting procedure. Including this time information requires the development of stochastic models of a neural discharge. These models, ideally, should be parsimonious, accurate, and lead to computationally efficient algorithms, a subject of active research, in, part in particular here at the Neural Math Center. This video will be shown in the afternoon, maybe today or tomorrow, the complete video because it's nine minutes. So just this part is of my interest. And in his paper for 2004, uh, he does spike sorting using both amplitude information and the time uh, between spikes from the same neuron. But his model did include interaction between neurons. This is a, a picture. We have uh, two neurons, one, two. So uh, he just considered the time between uh, neuron one, two, one, that's time, that's time. It didn't consider uh, time two, one, two, two, uh, two neuron one, two neuron two. Okay. So we are considering a more realistic model based on Gavs Locherbach. You want to do statistical model selection to do spike sorting using only the spike times. When I say spike times, I mean the moment of the time when the spike, spike occurs. So uh, I basically I will describe the model just with pictures. Uh, in here I have three neurons. In all neurons influence the other neurons, but did it influence it itself? In this graph here, we are considering uh, yn is a stochastic chain with a variable length. It will be explained in the course of Antonio, Guilherme, Aline, Claudia uh, later. Uh, this stochastic chain to has depends on the past. In the, this case, the past here is the moment where all spikes, all neurons spikes at least one time. Here we have the we have this time. Uh, here the spikes neuro one, here neuro three, here neuro two. I put it here one three two. So all neuron spikes in this time. So I I will count how many spikes it has. 
and the neuron too spikes in this time. So how many spikes from the other neurons who influence the neuron two? He writes neuron three and neuron one. So he give he receive plus two. And uh, the graph is uh, the neuron receive the influence of the the others neurons. So uh, when a When I have it here, I, ha I have to look uh, the neuron two spikes, the last spikes in here. So we receive from the other news, in this case the three in one, two spikes, two two charts in this case. Uh, in here, I have to look the last time when the neuron two spikes is was here. In this time, he received the charge plus one for the new one. So we have this information. Uh, the neuron two will have a distribution exponential of parameter two, and the neuron three have a distribution exponential of parameter one. We are considering when I uh, have a spike in this time. This this time the spike the, uh, the neuron one spikes so the neuron one can't spike and the another it can be the the next to spike so i calculate the the time until the next spike will depend of the this exponential because I have a result the minimum of the exponential distribution is the exponential distribution with the sum of these parameters. So if I sum one two I have an exponential parameter three. So the time t zero uh, is generated by this exponential. So I have another case. In this case uh, the spike three is the neural tree spikes in this time. So I have to look uh, the contest in this case have to look at the past on the all neuron spikes in this case three one three two so so I have to use all of them I count how many they contribute for the others I have these exponentials charts and I calculate the time t1 until the net spike so, in this case, spike two, the neuron two spikes. So, I have to look just these three events. In this case, because two spike here, the neuron three spike here, the neuron one spike here. The other times does doesn't matter for us. So I do that. I now consider we just have the times until the next spike. We don't know uh, what neurons generate then. What we want to do is to estimate the most likely configuration of the neurons to uh, spikes, given the, the times. To do that, we use the, the same method with Christophe Pouzat applying in his paper. We use the metropolitan hashing algorithm the basic idea of the metropolis hashing is you have uh, a configuration, you have up, you do update this configuration, uh, you propose uh, uh, to change the neuron from other, and you can change or not depends on the on the criteria. In this case, we have an example with the four neurons. We will test if the neuron tree. Sorry, uh, the first thing you consider it, you you have just the times. So you have to uh, give an initial uh, sequence of the neurons, in this case. So you, ha you go to update this sequence, depends on criteria. So uh, here we will update the, the neuron tree. So I have to look to the neuron before tree and after tree, one or four. Because we can't change three for one or four because we don't have two 
simultaneous spikes of the same neuron. Two steps, yes. So the, in this case, we have just uh, four neurons. The only you can change is two. So I can see if we change the three for two or not. Suppose uh, it will not change. So we have to look at now to neuron four. After uh, before as the neuron tree. So I can change to one or two. So I decide to one of them to propose to to model. Suppose I propose the one. So I decide to change or not this case. I in this case I change. So I do that for every single neuron in my sequence. I do that several times. So we estim we estimate the probability of each spike originate for each neuron. So I count how many times I see uh, the spikes in this position. So, for example, uh, I want to know if the 20 uh, spikes is, fr is from neuron 3. It's for ge it was generated from neuron 3. I count how many times appears the neuron 3 and divide for the total. There's a some difference to represent, and that's all. Uh, we have time for questions in this case. Uh, I was thinking more in the experimental setup, and uh, I was wondering, for example, in which region normally do you record that kind, that kind of extracellular uh, signal? And also, uh, how many years do you think that might compose that kind of signal, usually? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the number of the neuron you have to, to uh, give, yeah, suppose, I suppose I have four neurons, so I will calculate this with this criteria. So I, I still uh, want to propose a method to uh, choose how many neurons I have in this region. So my, in this f first thing, I, I suppose I have a, uh, a certain number of neurons in this case. Okay. In which region? Or in the brain? I guess this is a general mathematical approach who is not considering specifically. This is a just a mathematical approach who is doing. Normally, in the literature, they, they are in the literature. They are trying to use that kind of a statistic for what? For normally, for which region? It can be any region. Yeah, we're not assuming any hypothesis about the this. Okay, as Christophe Pouzat will be here again in two weeks uh, for ten days. And maybe we organize to a, a tutorial by streaming with him. Okay, thank you very much. We're almost in time now. So now a very, a very short technical break to prepare the tutorial. Three minutes. Okay, so this is the first uh, part of our tutorial. Today, Claudia, Aline and Guilherme will present lesson one. There will be a few exercises in the website of Neuromat in the afternoon. I hope you... Uh, on, on. <laughs> okay, so good morning, everybody. I would like to thank Antonio and the Neuromat team for allowing us to be here today and also kindly receiving the young students from Rio de Janeiro who are glad to show their results and, and of course all, probably all, all of you know that this is an exercise so that we can put together do two complementary we hope <laughs> um, perspectives of, 
of uh, contemporary science. So I'll start by talking a little bit about the idea of the brain as a statistician. So it's a, a defy for us. And uh, also within the tutorial, we'll talk uh, some of the work in progress with Aline, Guilherme, and Antonio Ricardo. Um, so so I'll, I'll give you sort of the theoretical background, some of the ideas that we have been discussing. Uh, and maybe uh, the first uh, uh, consequence of the idea of the brain as a, a statistician is uh, the corollary that the brain will be continuously making predictions about, about the world. So this is becoming prevalent. This is an idea which is becoming prevalent in neuroscience. So it's not very, very neat here, but this is a sequence of uh, uh, photographs taken from uh, two swordsmen. And uh, this is from Edward Muybridge um, uh, from the late 19th century. This, he was the precursor of, of movies. I thank Maria Luisa for <laughs> finding specifically this picture for us. And um, if you consider that uh, for each of these sequences, uh, each of these uh, swordsmen have to take in, uh, into account their bodies and uh, the uh, position and the, the movement and the, the dynamics of uh, his opponent and uh, uh, take a decision on which will be the next movement to perform, uh, you uh, quickly will see what is the defining problem when you think in terms of uh, statistics. Uh, um, this view is discussed in uh, uh, a review that we have done together with Antonio and Maria Luisa Rangel. It's in archives, so if you want to go further on these ideas, please go to the, to the paper. But in general, the idea would be that predicting would mean anticipating outcomes. In fact, this is not a new idea. This was advanced by von Helmholtz in the 19th century, and uh, it came to the field of uh, neurobiology by bringing uh, important uh, conceptual uh, issues so that we can, for instance, uh, establish uh, causal relationships between actions and then their consequences to uh, uh, think in terms of simulation of the body and the context in which the movement is being produced. Uh, uh, also, a re re reduction of uh, the uncertainties, the natural uncertainties that uh, we face when we are interacting in, with the world. And the uh, uh, main contribution of the work of Helmholtz is uh, giving the first clues of, uh, of uh, the concept of probabilistic estimate, estimation. So there are a bunch of, of papers and, uh, and, and people that have brought these ideas to neuroscience. So here again, this presentation will be available for those who want to visit this, uh, these people and this uh, work. But the point is how to tackle this problem experimentally, how to, uh, 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 which would be a, a possible instrument to, uh, to deal with uh, this um, uh, uh, constant uh, estimation that the brain is doing through time and then which uh, 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 scale this could be uh, attacked. So this is a sketch where uh, you have the main methods that are available today, nowadays, to, to, to experimentalists. And uh, this is the uh, log time scale and the x, uh, the x axis and the log size scale. And the methods that we consider as mo most appropriate to these uh, issues uh, range on this, dim uh, for humans at least, will be on these dimensions where, as you can see, you fall within the uh, millisecond scale. So uh, um, magnetoencephalography and uh, uh, electroencephalography, these are the methods that I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit for you today and discuss uh, on the results that have been brought on these dimensions. So 
quickly speaking, uh, magnet encephalography is a method that has uh, 30 years, 20 to 30 years, and uh, it's a very expensive uh, technology. Uh, it's available in few labs in the world, and it allows uh, capturing uh, changes in brain activity by measuring the changes in magnetic field. So for those who are more interested, uh, the uh, Wikipedia site is very good on this, uh, <laughs> on this topic. Uh, so uh, this uh, method has been uh, explored to um, evaluate uh, the, uh, in this paper from Todorovic and colleagues, the prior expectations that associate with the coding of a sound. So whenever uh, you hear a tone, you have an, activity, an activation in the brain. This is a MEG measurement, so you can see that red here means that uh, these uh, 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 sensors here are more activated. And this is a a field strength response associated with this uh, uh, activity. So uh, if you uh, localize uh, this information uh, using techniques, techniques of inverse modeling, you can identify that this region, the region that activates it is in the auditory cortex, in the temporal uh, cortex. And this is just to show that you have a a huge uh, response in frequency as that associates with the tone. But the more interestingly is that um, if you uh, compare the response in uh, field strength when you expect a repetition, which is in blue here, so this is a response for a first tone, and then you present a second tone whenever the subject knows that there will be an upcoming event, a uh, sensory event, a tone, you have uh, a response which is uh, lower than when the person uh, is surprised with uh, a new event. So whenever uh, the, the, the next tone is uh, unexpected. Um, uh, interestingly, this effect also occurs, for instance, when uh, you have a, a situation of omission. So, um, in, in a sequence of tones, uh, whenever you expect an omission, an event that doesn't come, there is lower activity in the temporal cortex as compared to the situation where you have an event that is an, uh, an omission that is unexpected. Uh, another methodology which has been developed, uh, it's, it's uh, um, more ancient in fact, but allows us to, uh, to work, to, to explore these uh, um, predictive events in the brain is electroencephalography. So uh, differently from magnetoencephalography here, we are capturing the changes in electrical fields uh, in the skull of the voluntaries. So here, uh, uh, again, we have a, a good uh, Wikipedia site to talk about this methodology. This is a person wearing a cap with uh, uh, 128 electrodes uh, positioned in the skull. And uh, we are basically measuring, in this case, extracellular current flow. And uh, within the uh, EEG uh, domain, uh, one of the uh, most used techniques is uh, to um, uh, extract what we call the event-related potential. So it's the response that associates with an event. So here you have uh, uh, several trials. You, you present to the volunteer several trials. And then you, you have the background of the signal and the response that associates with that trial. And uh, what we record in terms of EEG is this, this mixture of the response with the uh, spontaneous EEG activity. Um, using uh, EEG, um, one of the um, uh, uh, clear markers of uh, um, uh, 
of uh, prediction in the brain have been uh, named mismatch negativity. So what is the mismatch negativity? Here do you have a, a, um, a drawing of the 128 electrode positions in the skull. Um, and uh, if you take one of them, for instance, and here you have uh, um, the response that associates with a standard event, a beep, for instance, and a situation where you have a deviant event that could be another tone. Um, and the, re the difference between the two is in depicted in red. It's called mismatch negativity. So here again, when uh, it's uh, evident that the brain is expecting an event which comes differently than he was expecting, than, than it, it was expecting, and you have a clear response that associates with this difference. So this is a, a skull topography showing uh, that this negativity predominates uh, in the frontal regions. And um, so uh, the group of the N uh, uh, has taken this uh, uh, mismatch negativity um, uh, evidence of uh, prediction to um, explore uh, the brain activity that sorry associates to sequences of sounds. So they uh, adapted the paradigm where they present um, what they call the, a standard. So it's a sequence of tones, the same tones in series, five 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 song tones. And uh, a, a group uh, for a group of uh, of uh, stimuli, they put a local dev. They call the local deviant, which is pa 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 pa, for instance. And they uh, blocked this. Uh, well, and, and the third condition was a situation of omission. You have uh, four tones, and the fifth tone is omitted. And they they manipulated the blo the, the the blocks so that you could have a high percent of standard stimuli with, uh, for, for instance, 75% of local standard, what they call local standard, the sequence of five tones, and 15% uh, 15 of local deviance and 10% of omission. In the second block, they inverted this uh, context. But just to show you that, uh, as uh, just, uh, we just have seen, in these situations of a sequence of events, uh, when you compare the response that associates with, this, uh, 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 with the um, local deviant, with the deviant sound, which is plotted here in pink, as compared with the standard in green, you have uh, a, a mismatch negativity here. This is a, a EEG a, a, a topological map, and these two are MAG topological maps. So they also compare the, the two techniques. Um, again, uh, this mismatch negativity has been also recorded by means of intracranial electrodes in uh, epileptic patients, and you see that this beautiful clear response when you compare the local deviant and local standard uh, uh, sounds. And uh, a second um, um, uh, response that uh, then also uh, uh, evaluated was the omission response when you compare the situation of omission when the stand with, with the standard. So uh, here again you see that in, uh, in uh, uh, purple, uh, the uh, the situation, the, sta the standard response, and uh, in uh, uh, pink, the omission response. So this uh, uh, results tell us that the brain detects missing events. That I mean, those that were expected, and reacts strongly to unexpected events. Uh, so. Uh, we in within neuromat we were uh, considering um, that uh, this is uh, few as uh, it's too too few as uh, an evidence of a brain as a statistician i mean these two uh, um, 
uh, markers are uh, associated to single events and more, uh, more than this, there is no um, uh, evidence that uh, a structure, a structurated uh, sequence of stimuli uh, uh, would uh, be treated uh, in, in a specific way, I mean, that the brain will take in consideration uh, a sequence of events and have a, 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 a where cat, each symbol will be affected by the previous one and will also lead information of the next one. So we started discussing a paradigm uh, with uh, this team where we uh, made the stimuli of uh, hand clap sequences organized in ternary, quaternary, and definite uh, order. Uh, so um, the idea here will be uh, trying to retrieve the structure of the source. This structurated, structurated stimuli would would they lead? Uh, uh, would they modulate the EEG signal so that uh, this information can be retrieved uh, uh, in the EEG signal? So here we are working with uh, uh, independent samples produced by uh, distinct stochastic rhythmic sources. And each sample will be composed by a strong beats, weak beats, and silent units generated by a probabilistic source. So um, the first uh, rhythm that I'll, I'll show you, the first sequence, the first structure, is the vowels. So we have two corresponding to the strong beat, one weak beat, and zero silence unit. And uh, to, to generate these stimulus, we start with the de deterministic sequence so that two, one, one, two, one, and pa, 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 pa. And we replace... Uh, each in the, the, the independent way, each symbol by uh, one by zero with the probability e. So I'll show you the sound. I hope that it works. Can you hear? The second rhythm is a simplified samba. So again, two will be a strong beat, one a weak beat, and zero a constitutive silence unit or an omitted weak beat. So we start with the, again with the deterministic sequence where we have two, one, zero, one, two, one, zero, one, and we replace in the, replace in the independent way each symbol one by zero with the probability e. So. This will be the samba. And uh, the third one will be uh an independent rhythmic unit. So each symbol, two, one, and zero, will be uh, chosen uh, in an independent way with the probability of one third. So this is the next symbol. So um, here will be the EEG signal, and uh, we will mark each symbol's, s symbol's onset with uh, an, an identifier. For instance, here you have V2 uh, corresponding to the number 2 in our sequence, or V1A, which in Samba would be the first uh, number 1, and V12 would be the second number one, so that we can re retrieve these chunks of signal afterwards so that we can treat this information. And the question here would be, has the EEG data anything to say about the structure of the source?
Abrir, né? É, bota em view. Hello. Uh, first of all, I just want to know how much time do we have to to go on because I check on uh, my phone. It's five minutes. Okay. <laughs> I will do my best. <laughs> okay. So uh, in this first part of this tutorial, Claudio was explained to us some methodology, methodologies to analyze this paradigm that is uh, is the brain a statistician, right? So in this in this second part, uh, we will again talk about the stimuli that we proposed here, and not only this, we'll, we will go deep on the, the structure of the the the, the source, okay? So the title is Statistical Model Selection. We'll try to explain what is this at the end of this whole tutorial. And also, what do we mean by stochastic modeling by the brain activity, right? Okay, so the title is uh, the Retrieving a Hiding Context Tree Model from a Sequence of EEG Chunks. Uh, it seems it's uh, complicated, but uh, we'll try to 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so we will try to explain first what's a contract tree model, and then we'll try to introduce what is a hiding context tree model, and hopefully we'll explain how to uh, to use this this new model to analyze uh, the EEG data as uh, Claudio was explaining to us before. So again, just to reinforce, this is uh, the, the conjecture that we want to, 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 to answer, let's say, that is the brain is a statistician. For this, we propose a new experimental protocol, as the cloud was explaining. And then uh, to explain, I mean, to try to, to tackle this question, we add a structure to the, to, to that, uh, to the, the stimuli a random, I mean, now, as uh, Claudio was uh, was uh, explaining uh, in the work of the end, for instance, the sequence is deterministic. So there is some some uh, percentage of the stimulus is uh, pa, 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 and then they omit or they increase the volume of this, the, 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 the beat, but this is deterministic. So we now we propose something different. We propose to add a, a random sequence, but which has which has some structure. Okay, so it's a totally different approach. And uh, but then I have to explain what is this structure, right? So uh, the structure will be based on context tree model. So to explain this, I have to tell you what is a context tree. And uh, of course, after that, we have to explain how to retrieve context tree from an EEG sample. So again, so this is the, a good picture to tell you again and again, to explain what is, what is uh, the idea of the, the, the whole work here, is that we have a source, so they produce some, some stimuli, songs, in our case, rhythms, and then the brain somehow process this, out, this, this information, and then from this we measure this, this, this brain processing, and then we get some data. In this example, in our, in our work, it's a EEG data. And we do this again for a, a second source, and you have a different, different uh, set of uh, uh, data. So the questions we want to ask is, do we stimuli for different random source produce distinct brain process? Or again, do we, the EEG, EEG data say anything about the structure of the source? And uh, okay, again, do the EEG data say something? <laughs> and then to, to, to answer this question, we, we, 
we, we, if we succeed answer this question, this will strongly suggest that the brain was able to statistically identify the structure of the source, producing the stimulant. And, and this would imply that uh, strongly that the brain is eff effectively doing something like statistical mode selection. Okay, so this is... Uh, uh, okay, but uh, let's see what's the structure of the source, right? So for this, uh, we will remember the way the stimuli were produced, and not only this, we'll uh, look in details how we do this. For this, uh, Aline will talk about. Como que passa aqui? Well, uh, let's remember how do we generate the stimuli, okay? As Claudia was saying, we start with a, a deterministic sequence of strong bits and weak bits, for instance. So it's like uh, tum ta ta tum ta ta, okay? And then we erase the weak bits with probability of 20%. So uh, actually what the subject uh, listen is like uh, sequence like this. So it's tum ta ta tum ta tum ta tum ta ta. Okay? So how can we generate a sample like the Honda one? Okay? Because uh, we erase each weak bit independently. Okay? So it's like flip a coin. We flip a coin each time and decide if we put the weak bit or if we don't put it. For instance, if I want to generate this sequence in a time n, I don't know. I have uh, I don't have any information about the change, so I have um, I need some information. Okay, we start looking one pass forward. I have uh, let me write this one work. Um, in the terminist case, in the we have something like this. Uh, do you can see? Yeah. Right. Bigger. Bigger. So in the random sequence, we have something like this. Okay. If I have no information about the, the time n, I have to come back when, when one pass forward. Okay. I have three options. I can... Backward. Backward. Yeah. I have three options. If I, uh, I come back one step, I can see a, a two a 1 and a 0, okay? If I see a 2, I have, I can have this kind of situation, this kind of situation, or this kind of situation, okay? So if this is my n step, n, n minus 1, actually, um, the next step can be a 1, okay? A weak bit that I didn't erase it, and a weak bit bit that I erase it. I just have these two options, okay? But if I have a zero or, or a one, I can have this situation here. I will put here. This one, this one, or this one. So if this is the uh, n minus one, I don't know if this is a one or, for instance, here, uh, the n step could be a two, okay? So I'm still, I'm still not able to preview the next step to say anything about the x n. Okay. Say it again. What? Yeah. What I should say? Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, this is the most difficult part, so I will say it again. Uh, if I, I, I just say that I have a, a 1 or a 0 in the n minus 1 step. So, what? I want to say something about the n step, okay? So, I have three kinds of sequence. I have uh, this one, this one, and this one. Yeah, two zero zero. Yeah. 
If I say if I know only that I have a, a one, this one could be a one in this case. So the next will, the next step will be a two. If I have this one here, the next step would be a one. And if I have a zero, could be this zero. So the next step would be a two. Could be this zero. So the next step would be a one. And would could be that zero. And the next step would be a zero. So I cannot. I'm not. What is wrong? It's not enough. I don't have uh, enough information to preview the next step. Okay. So I need more information. So I have to come back. I have. Uh, I want to say something about the the, the end step, the step. Yeah, to say something. I want. I want to be able to, uh, to to be able to say if the next step is a zero, is a one, is a two, it's something. Okay. The 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 thing is only with this information, knowing that in the the last pass I have a zero or a, a one, I'm not able to say anything about the next step. Okay. So I have to come back uh, a little more. And then I have all the options because, as I say here, before um, a one I can have a two, or I can have a zero, a zero, or I can have a, another one. Okay, so I have these three options, and for zero also, I can have a zero uh, followed by a one, or for uh, another zero, or for a two. Preceded, yeah. So. Again, if I, I I have a two here, followed by a one, I just have two options because, as in the in the sequence, I have only a one and a zero. I don't have another two. Okay. If I'm in in this case, if I have a zero or a one followed by a zero or another one, I just can have another two. Okay. Is it clear? No. So this is kind of what we call it the tree. Me at this one. The question is the following. We want to, to define an algorithm. We want an algorithm to generate the next symbol. Only knowing the past. And we want the smallest possible algorithm. So we can summarize all these informations in a tree. It's the same kind of thing that we have before, but now we are uh, uh, omitting the xn, xn minus 1, xn minus 2, but uh, it's, uh, basically it's the same. So we have a tree and a family of probability transitions indexed by each leaf. Okay, I will explain here. Hmm? <laughs> For instance, in the leaf two, I have this kind of two, this, this, and this. But two is always uh, information, enough information, a sufficient uh, information for say something about the, the next step. For instance, uh, this is a notation only, okay, to say that after a two, what's the probability of have a, a zero, okay? Given that, knowing that in the Step n, I have a 2, n minus 1 or n. You can see in the next step a 0. But what is a 0? 0 is a, a, a 1 that I erased, a weak bit that we omitted in the, in the sequence. And we omit the weak bits with probability 0, uh, 20% or 0 0.3. Okay? After a 2, I can see a weak bit. Knowing that I have a weak, uh, a strong bit, I can see a weak bit if I didn't, uh, if I don't erase it. Okay, in the experiment or epsilon that Claudia was talking about is 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 point two, twenty percent. So I don't er erase a weak bit with uh, eighteen percent. Okay, so dot eight, 
and I never have a, a strong bit followed by another strong, strong bit. So uh, this probability is zero. And this is what I say. Yeah, this is what I was saying. So after a, a strong bit, I just have two options, or a weak bit or a raised bit. So, and this happens with 10% or 8% of probability. For instance, if I look to the zero, zero past, so it's actually this case, I just have one option that after a zero, zero, I always have a strong bit. So all the other, all the others probabilities are equal to zero and this will happens with 100% of probability, okay? And this happens because after, because actually zero, zero was two weak bits that we erase it. And after two weak bits, we have always a strong bit. And a strong bit is never uh, erased. So I will not have, I, I cannot have this kind of situation on this kind of situation. Is it clear? Oh, this is an exercise that you can find in the <laughs> website, in the page of the, the Neuromat, maybe, I don't know. And uh, to, this is for looking the other leaves, okay, in the tree and say what is the probability of have a one, a two or a zero. The other uh, stimuli that you have is the samba. Uh, that is essentially almost the same, but now we have more options. Uh, the sequence that we can see is something. But in the next slide, I will need it. <laughs> So if we okay, we can have this kind of situations. So this kind of sequence, when we erase, erase only the second one, or we don't erase anything, or we erase both, or actually it's not hit, but we could erase only the first one. So we have, if we say, if we made the same kind of um, arc, we can construct a tree. And we can have the same kind of um, the same kind of situation. For instance, if I have a two, I don't have I, this. The, the two is always a, what is coming. Okay, two is always a sufficient information. So if I have a strong bit, I just have two options: or I have a weak bit, or I have a weak bit that I, I raise it. So with some probability, I will have a one here or a zero. If I know only the one, this is not uh, sufficient information. So, now, so I have to come back and see what is going on in, in, the, in the one more step in the past. So if I know that I, I, I see a two, a, strict, uh, a strong bit, a weak bit, so here I can have only a zero because zero in this case, we, we cannot change. So with probability one here, in this case, we have a zero. And I, another exercise is, is do the same kind of uh, arc and look what's hap what happens with the probability of transitions of the, the chain. So this kind of tree with uh, probability transitions was uh, is actually is a um, class of models introduced by Hissen, and these leaves uh, are defined at, as context. Okay, that actually uh, context. Okay. A context is the shortest portion of the past which contains the relevant information. So why relevant? Because 
I know that a two is a, a sufficient information. So if I say to you that uh, I have a one and a two, this one doesn't matter. It could be a zero and nothing will change. So it's, it's enough to know only the two. I, I don't have to come back more in the past. So each leaf, uh, if you look to the two different trees, you can see that the leaves don't have the same uh, length. So we call it contest stochastic chains with memory of variable length because the, the portion of the path is changing. And they are also called contest tree models. So now we need to know the second part is how to retrieve the structure of this handle, the handle source, and Guilherme told you how. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I hope you could follow what Aline was trying to explain. The, the structure, so the structure of the source we mean by the, the shape of the, the tree. Okay, this is uh, what we mean by structure. Uh, so again, this exercise uh, there, w there will be on the web page in the afternoon. And then, uh, if one, if you want to try to do it and have some uh, questions, you can ask for me, Aline, um, any time. Uh, so okay, so this part is the end of today, uh, which uh, will introduce for tomorrow the subject of tomorrow, uh, that is retrieving the structure of the random source. Okay. So, I, I would like to stress this again, it's a kind of review. So, in our experimental protocol, the stimuli were produced by context tree models, okay, like these ones. Uh, the structure of the context tree uh, is given by a tree of contexts, context, and uh, for, each, for each context, we have uh, a transition probability. So, so we call the 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 whole the whole uh, the set of whole transistor probability a family of transistor probabilities. Uh, so, what do we mean by retrieving a context tree model? Okay, so we mean that if you generate, if I give you a sample, okay, generated by one of these two trees, let's say. And then uh, retrieving a context tree mean by in identify a context tree. I mean, we try to recover this context tree doing some statistical method to, to, to somehow recover this. And not only this, also the, the transition probability for each, for each context. We have to estimate correctly const in a constant, consistent way what is uh, the exactly probability uh, of giving in this context what is the probability of the next step. Okay, you have to recover this. Uh, so this is in statistics is what is called statistical model selection. So um, is this is recover the structure of the, the, the random source. Uh, okay, so let's talk about a little bit uh, statistical context tree model selection. Again, I will tell you again, uh, that this means that if I give you a sample, which is produced by context tree, then uh, there is some available uh, statistical tools to to identify this th th this tree, and uh, not only this, they estimate the associated transistor probabilities. So uh, the <laughs> let me make some picture. In a nutshell, the idea of this is the following. That's why people don't erase the blackboard. Okay, so so the idea is uh, start from uh, I, okay. My task is I give you a sample. So there is some symbols here, some bad notation. X1, X2, to Xn. So this is uh, each one of these these values can be in our case. 0, 1, or 2, okay? 
And the, the task is of, I give you this, and I want to retrieve the context which generate, generate this sequence. Let's say it is in the vaults. So this is two, and here's zero, zero, and you, you can feel this as before. And then the, the idea is that uh, given, given uh, the length, your sample, you start saying, okay, my initial, uh, my initial tree is something like the complete tree. Let's say length three, okay. This is, this is your initial guess. And so on. You do this for the same, uh, okay? And then you start pruning each one of these branches according to some rule, okay? You, you ha we have to to specify. And the rule is, uh, I mean, it's simple, and uh, it takes account uh, a balance between the goodness of fit versus the size of the tree. Uh, why is that? Why is that? Because, I mean, if you have as large as your tree is, you you can, uh, I mean, you will uh, explain much better your sequence of symbols. But uh, on the other hand, as, as large as your tree is, you, you have to estimate more and more parameters like the the transition probability this is uh, somehow is is uh, expensive let's say to do so that's why we need a balance and uh, doing this balance you can estimate this okay uh, we i mean this is the the, whole, the only thing i will talk about i will not enter in details so uh, this is uh, something was proposed by uh, Hissening, and he called this uh, algorithm context. Okay. And uh, and then okay after all this we come back to the question: Is the brain a statistician? So, in other terms, is the brain able to perform an algorithm of statistical mode selection like like the one the uh, Hissening proposed? So the idea that the brain is a statistician doing statistical mode selection is a guideline conjecture of the our project so that this is what we want to 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 prove and uh, but how to obtain experimental evidence supporting this conjecture so this is uh, the question and uh, just to to stress again what the cloud was telling that that the end for instance obtain experimental evidence that uh, unexpected occurrences in regular sequence produce characteristic ma marks in the EEG data, like the mismatch negativity. Mismatch negativity. But uh, we need more than evidence of mismatch neg negativity to support this conjecture, okay? So to, dis to discuss this issue, we need to do statistical model selection in a new class of Tokarski uh, processes that uh, we will present tomorrow. And uh, <laughs> the, okay. And uh, the name of this the, of this class is a hidden context tree models. Uh, so I will stop here because everybody is uh, angry. And uh, so uh, I hope you, we could explain a little bit about the experimental protocol, the stimuli and the, stru the structure of the source, and also what we mean by uh, is the brain a statistician, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, so lunch time. Lunch time. Questions, Questions? No, Questions? no but uh, yes, please.
Okay. We we discussed a lot about it, Marcel, and then we decided not to prime the the, the subject. Just start with the already missing elements. So the person has to extract the structure from the. This would be nice, yeah. But uh, we suspect that we'll sh we sh should have a long, long experiment to extract. Uh, I know the trees are identified, but yes, but how long does the brain need to, to ah, keep the, the tree sequence so they start to predict it? That's my question. How long does the brain to learn the sequence of the tree? That's the question. That's a good question, Marcel. Yes. Uh, that's a, a suggestion to do this kind of analysis and then uh, it would be nice to, to see the different of doing that and uh, prime the brain and then see if they, this time gets shorter. Response uh, depends on the uh, intensity of the, the the signal. The intensity of the, the, uh, the sound. Do, 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 double the sound, double the the signal. Uh, I, I imagine that the response, the response changes through time. Sorry. Or you mean uh, does it? No, 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 no. The the EEG response depends on the sound intensity. The intensity, you mean when you compare uh, two with one, for instance? No, 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 no. Pa 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 pa. Okay. Exactly, because uh, yes, okay. there is an internal representation all conjecture, of, of all conjecture, No, okay, that's a point. Steve, uh, Steven's law factor. But, 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 but that's a point. But let's discuss it tomorrow, okay. because this is exactly the topic of tomorrow. <laughs> Não, não, Cláudia, ele está achando que o som forte produz uma energia diferente do som fraco. A intensidade do som. My friends, we don't have time to discuss this today. This is lunch time. This is the subject of tomorrow. Não, querida, ele diz 2, 1, 1 ou 2, 1, 1. É isso que ele disse. Mas ele que perguntou isso. Let's discuss tomorrow, because tomorrow that's the topic. We have uh, 40 mi uh, one hour and 40 to have a...